<laughs> Hola. Hello. Welcome back. Another week. Voice of the Republic. Doing it to your ears. This is Ed. Mike. And Carl. And tonight, and we got a special guest. I'm so excited. Ah! <laughs> I've been wanting to tell people, like, ever since I got in t contact with him, uh, but I was afraid it wasn't going to happen, but we do have him here. Uh, you might know him from Mystery Science Theater 3000. You might know him from Freaks and Geeks. You might know him from Cinematic Titanic. But however you know him, you love him. Mr. Trace Ballou. Hi there. <gasps> Hello. My head's on fire. Oh. Yes, it's your shoulder is on fire. Ah. Uh, <laughs> that's because your show is red hot. That's Ooh, right. Damn. Thank you, All sir. Right. Oh, yeah. Listen to that, people. Slam dunk. Slam dunk. Taking special effects to the next level for us. Yeah, it's, it's green screen, really. It is. It's third degree burn green screen. <laughs> What's going on? Live from the fish tank. This oh. is going on. Well, yeah, this thanks for coming in tonight and joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. This is awesome. Great. Great. We might so, as well wrap it up. I can't get better. Yeah, we're done. Okay. Wow, <laughs> uh, Cigarettes for everyone? Yeah. Uh, oh, wait, huh? There you go. <laughs> so I was thinking what we could do is uh, get Mystery Science Theater 3000 out of the way because... I, I th think that's the elephant in the room. A lot of people probably know you best from your roles as Dr. Forrester and Crow. Um, so we'll go ahead and talk about that real quick, and then we can just get that out of the way and talk about more creative and fun stuff. Not that Mystery Science Theater 3000 is, isn't fun, but I'm, I'm sure you've talked it to death at this point. <laughs> current, current fun stuff. Yes. The currently active fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, so... I, I spent a lot of time trying to find questions that you haven't been asked a thousand times uh, because I know a lot of people like to ask you, like, what's your favorite episode? What's your favorite joke? Like, for some reason, you're going to remember one specific joke out of six years of <laughs> doing a TV show. Um, I wanted to do something a little bit more broader because people see you on screen, but they might not know that you also wrote for the show. Uh, you did set design. You did art, you helped build the puppets, you refined the, the puppet designs after uh, you guys got picked up by comedy. Uh, what of those roles were your favorite when you got into the show? Oh boy, I mean that just being able to do so many things is so unusual in television production, because usually you're category into one, you know, you're a writer and that's what you do, or you're a performer and that's what you do. So we were really fortunate in uh, it was kind of like hippie TV. You know, we had this little playhouse and everybody did a little bit of everything. Over time, you know, it, it became more restrictive, but I loved doing all of that because I think it helped, it helped me anyway. You know, uh, if I wasn't building something, um, I was thinking about the next part of the process. Or if I was writing something, I'd be thinking about, oh, Here's a little mechanism we could do with Crow that would make that easier. Um, and, and maybe that is my attention span, you know. Well, focus at the task at hand, boy. Instead of <laughs> yeah. daydreaming about that puppet in the other room. <laughs> but I, it's such a rare opportunity do you get to do that, you know, get to do so many different things. When I moved to Los Angeles, it was just one thing. You do one thing. And uh, that got frustrating after a while. Well, prior to uh, MST3K, were, um, what, did you have any puppet puppeteering experience? Uh, were you mechanical, or was that mostly Joel's role? Uh, I actually worked uh, with my brother for a long time, and he's a mechanical engineer. And so I picked up a lot of uh, tips and techniques. And we were always building stuff in my family. We had a workshop in the basement. My folks were both artistic and... and uh, they were big on salvage. I mean, they would, my dad was in the insurance business and he was always bringing something home to fix, like a piano or, you know, <laughs> furniture and things like that. And, uh, so it was uh, getting your hands on stuff and actually building stuff was uh, a, a huge part of my uh, childhood. And uh, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if kids are still, well, there's the whole maker movement now in the, 3D printing and all that stuff, but um, 
you know, I've always had a passion for that. I still do. I still weld and do bad carpentry and really bad electrical work, as you can tell by the lighting. <laughs> did you um? Did you build the the fireplace behind you, or or rather, did you build put the green screen? Is that your design? Um, that is our only source of entertainment right now. Is the <laughs> fireplace? That's how uh, how backwards in time we've gone. <laughs> like throwing things in on a Friday night. Yeah, exactly. That's our big screen TV right there. <laughs> there you go. What looks cool burning? Oh, let's burn. <laughs> Maybe you do what I did in Boy Scouts every once in a while, just throw like a can of green beans in there and see how many logs you can spit when it explodes. <laughs> uh, green beans would be awesome in there. That would be that would be cool. Wait, an empty, a, a closed can of green beans? Is that yeah, what? and we, we, we got really scientific with it at our Boy Scout camp because we found that green beans were probably one of the best because it had so much water in it and it would produce more steam. Uh, so, like, what would happen is you get a can, and it would start boiling in there, and next thing you know, the can would just explode, and, like, we would blow apart logs. And we even got so sophisticated, we'd get these cardboard tubes, and we'd put SpaghettiOs in the bottom of it, and then we'd aim it at other troops' camps, and it'd explode, and it'd just be like a SpaghettiO cannon. And, like, and we, it got to the point that no other troops would camp next to us. We had to get, like, our own little campsite in the, in the reservation there. Because everyone just hated being around us, because we just would do dumb stuff like that all the time, and I'm surprised we didn't get kicked out of the the, <laughs> the camps most of the time. But yeah, we got really scientific with it. We're like, all right, well, this corn, no, corn's not bad. Oh, we definitely got a bigger thing with green beans. There must be more water in there. You know, it's like we got really down into the nitty gritty with it. Carl Watkins, Del Monte terrorist. <laughs> Yeah, that that's the kind of stuff that we did too. I'm surprised that we survived our childhood because we were always building stupid stuff, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, I used to have a collection of uh, railroad flares that I would find in the switching yards near our house, and I would store them. I would hide them from my dad in the garage next to the gasoline because you <laughs> never find them there. Of course. So uh, just the dumb stuff you do as kids, but that's how you learn. You learn mm -hmm. what is cool. You learn about science. If uh, you don't blow something off your body, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's why <laughs> I'm not good at math sense. because I never had to deal with subtraction. <laughs> <laughs> you can always go up to ten, but never back down to nine. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, but what, what do you think about the whole maker movement? Is that something that like you, you kind of wish that maybe was around when you were a little bit younger that you could get in there and like get in on that whole? Because right now it is a huge big thing where people are getting back into like these industrial arts like uh, glass blowing and welding and and metal working and woodworking and stuff like that. Do you, do you wish there was like, you know, you could be more involved with that sort of stuff or? Well, when, when I was in school, we still had all that stuff in industrial arts, you know. So I learned printmaking and uh, model rocketry. We had ham radio. We had electronics. We had woodworking, plastic working, metal working, forging, leather working. Uh, I'm surprised I got any kind of education beyond you know, photography. We had all of this stuff. Just what an awesome, you know, set of tools to be exposed to. Um, you know, I'm not good at any of them, but knowing that you don't have to be afraid of stuff, you can take stuff apart. And uh, I, I love it. I think the maker movement is so cool, and places like iFixit where, you know, they, they're they more pro, if, if you can't fix it, you know, you don't own it, that kind of philosophy. Right. Um, because uh, I want to be the guy that's valuable when society crumbles I want to be the guy that has some skills, and they go, well, I don't know, uh, I'm hungry, what do I do? And I go, well, have you tried fishing or hunting? <laughs> yeah. uh, why do I do that? You know, my car don't work, what do I do? Well, <laughs> let's, let's make it run on wood. You know, let's, <laughs> Hop um, on my tall bike, I'll show you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I will help you pump water from the stream with this bicycle. <laughs> but, uh, well, um, oh, go ahead. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you you go ahead first. <laughs> Fine, I will. Now it's a staring contest. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, since there are so many 
there has been so many maker advances. Uh, what do you wish that? Do you ever look back and or do you ever see like something like three D printing uh, that you wish you would have had during the MST three K days? Three D printing would have been awesome because we were collecting all those robot parts from junk stores and thrift stores, and you know we just thought we would need to build one robot each, and then as time went on, we went well. You know, the parts break down, or we need, like, 18 servos for a sketch. Uh, <laughs> and, we, you know, we were going to the fans and go, they would be bringing us parts to these things. And then people started molding uh, the parts of the robots. And now you can find them all on e eBay, or, or there's a couple of people online that build them from parts and sell the parts, which is kind of weird because... These are just things we found in thrift stores, and now people have replicated them so meticulously. But uh, that would have helped a lot if we three D printing would have would have saved our bacon a number of times. And I'll bet that once the popularity of the show took you know took hold, the parts that were normally a little more available were then now gone. Exactly. Because, yeah. Yeah. We created this market, and suddenly, you know, bowling pins went up in price. Exactly. You know? like, yeah, on eBay, like four hundred dollars for a bowling pin. All those yeah, mystery it's like science it's fans. Crap, plastic. You know, uh, the floralier, uh, floralier um, Tupperware uh, flower holder thing. Very yeah. rare. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. rare. I think somebody even researched um, and went back to the company to see if they still make it and they didn't have the molds or something like that. It's like, <laughs> that's how meticulous these, the, the fans of the show were. Sure. Um, the other problem we always had with the parts was that they were a, a type of plastic that paint wouldn't stick to. Oh. Uh, and I've got some friends in Illinois that were huge fans of the show and scientists, and they, uh, years later, they sent me the... Uh, the uh, the something to do with the molecular structure of the surface of the plastic and how you had to affect it so it would take a paint. And it's like, uh, what? Did it work? <laughs> Did you do uh, it? Did it work? I never tried it. I never tried it. Uh, but the, you know, we just bought more paint. That was the easier thing. For <laughs> yeah, just touch it. Yeah. yeah. But you're absolutely right. We created a, man, a demand for these <laughs> these parts, and then suddenly we can't afford them. <laughs> so funny. There's like a black market at a convention. Like you got bootlegs in the Mystery Science Theater 3000 bot parts like yeah. right on the same table. Right. <laughs> well, it happened with the old uh, Grayflex flash handles, and people wanted to make their own Darth Vader lightsaber handles. Like you could go right. get a, a mold or any kind of replica, but yeah. no, we need the actual one from the 30s and 40s. We need yeah. to have that. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it's just all this stuff was kit bashed. And, yeah. it's, you know, I even had people come and ask me and then figure out what parts I had used on the Satellite of Love model. <laughs> and I thought it was some obscure um, space shuttle uh, model kit um, that had a, a gantry. And I got it because it had a lot of detailed parts and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they figured out where, where all that stuff came from. I am amazed at some <laughs> of the the replicas and models that are made. I am just, like, blown away by this stuff, that it's so meticulous. And it's really impressive to take into consideration this was the early days of Internet, too, so it wasn't like you could just go to Google, you know, and break down, like, well, I mean, what, what are the different lacrosse masks? You know, it's like, uh, you know, it's things yeah. like that. To like, and then compare them to, like, oh, here's Crow. Here's, uh, no, that's not the right mask. You know, it's like people had to really put forth effort back then to do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, people are smart. I mean, that's that's the cool thing, or one of the cool things about the sci-fi community is that they are observant and very smart. And it's like, I would see stuff go by and I go, mm, phaser is kind of a squarish thing with a point on it, isn't it? I go, no, here's what a phaser looks like, and here's the part that comes off. Uh, and it's like, how did you build that? That is brilliant. And I, I just, I love... Um, the detail and uh, the craftsmanship. Oh, look at these, the Vader's fighting 501st, the guys that make mm -hmm. these beautiful Stormtrooper uniforms, better yeah. than the, the movie. Yeah. I mean, these yeah. looks like, it look like you could go into space with them. It's just absolutely stunning work. 
there's some really great artists and craftsmen out there. And especially when, like, on cases like that, where they have to make the the uniform actually work practically, because you know, in, in movies, like I say, RoboCop, Peter Weller, anytime he's in a in a car, he's not wearing the bottom half of his his costume yeah. because he couldn't bend at the waist in the RoboCop yeah. costume. You know, it's like so if you see someone walking around in a Robo costume, like, and that guy's bending over at the waist or doing anything that requires sitting, he yeah. had to modify that original design to get it to do that. And same with Stormtrooper armor. It's like all this joint didn't bend quite the way. And, like, so you're going around the conventions and you're trying to, like, I need to get a cup of water. You know, it's like, and then they make it work. They actually make it better, like you said. So it's it's really yeah. impressive what people do. Well, and they have to build their own uh, vacuform machines, too. Yeah. Um, but that's yeah. how I started learning about... Vader's fighting 501st is like I was looking for a, a vacuform machine to make some stuff, and I go, well, how do you find a big one? Well, make one. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> so I got onto all these forums of, with these, these guys who were building this stuff, um, and just like not only did you make this awesome costume, but you built the equipment to make it on. Yeah. It's like, bravo, sir. My hat is off. You know, I think this <laughs> I got off my helmet. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make you guys some equipment this weekend. I'm just thinking about this. <laughs> need some special equipment from me. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, let's go ahead and take a break. Uh, we'll come back tomorrow, and we'll talk some more uh, with Mr. Trace Ballou. Uh Maybe talk more about like uh, the Mystery Science Theater 3000 fandom, which... Uh, Oh, it's just a crazy group of people with all three of us being included in it. Uh, but Excellent. in the meantime, if you like the show, contact us. Uh, Republicom is always open. You can call us at 407-409-8749. Uh, Two-minute limit, please, on the phone lines. Or if you want to send us a voicemail through MP3 or WAVE or just a regular old text email, you can email us at voiceofrep at gmail.com. And if any of that went too fast for you, just stop by vorradio.com and all of our information is there. Mm -hmm. That's right. We'd love to hear from you. Sounds or like not. I rehearsed that. <laughs> <laughs> so, it sounds like you do it every week. It's amazing. Yes, yeah, man. I've become a professional now. <laughs> well, you know, don't get a big head about it. I'm just saying. Uh, don't get cocky, kid. Don't get cocky, kid. Cool. So, we'll then until uh, tomorrow. Cool. All right. <laughs> May the force be with that ass. <laughs> <laughs>